policy has really fallen by the wayside, you know? Uh -huh. It's like, I think of it that even, like, I feel like now, actually, hopefully this doesn't date the podcast too much when I say it, but it's like, you know, like, now there's this whole conversation about, like, the abortion thing, right? And, like, Trump gave that speech the other day where he's sort of trying to, like, moderate his position on that and this kind of thing. And, and uh -huh. I've heard some, like, very serious people saying, hmm, well, you know, like, Mike Pence denounced this, and, like, is this going to, like, risk his support with the evangelicals and this kind of thing? Because there used to be this idea that, like, abortion was, like, the one policy thing that you couldn't deviate from. Like, you had to be 100% pro-life to be a Republican in good standing. Uh, but even now, I'm starting to wonder, like, if Trump could, in theory, come out tomorrow and say, like, pro-choice, uh, pro like, that's where it's at. And would he lose any support? I don't know. Maybe not. Like, I think that the policies have become so irrelevant in this in this culture of, of hyperpolarization, and particularly on the Republican side, like, just the deep personal fidelity to Trump above everything else. Yeah. Yeah, people think these Overton windows are these like set things and it's like where you exist in when in reality they're not only are they incredibly fluid, uh, but more importantly, they're unknown. Nobody really knows yeah. where they are. So a politician could discover that there's actually way more room here than we previously thought, which I think Trump did accidentally. I don't give him credit for anything. Yeah. Trump, I think accidentally discovered or ended up in an area like, oh, shit, I can shit on prisoners of war and I don't have to support American foreign yes. policy and all this shit or whatever. And I'll be like, yeah, we actually go for this. And it's not like the Overton window is necessarily moving, although in a way you phrase it, yeah, that is kind of happening. But it's just that there are a lot of positions that people could stick out that we don't even know the American public has an appetite for yet um, because things can change on the ground very 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 quickly depending on the conditions that exist in the country for going through israeli palestinian history one of the mistakes i made like three or four months ago i was like well look at the polling this is what these people want yes. um, but then historically when when huge peace deals are signed or like huge conflicts happen or whatever opinion on the ground can shift incredibly quickly such that if i would have said like oh well on you know on june 1st uh, 1967, you know, this is what everybody thought before the Six Day War or whatever. Um, and I say, there's no way that this would happen. There's no way that these two countries would agree on peace. There's no way. And then you go 10 days later, and it's like, damn, everybody's opinion has changed dramatically yes. based on what's happened. That, yeah, there's always a lot of movement or more movement, I think, than people realize sometimes. Hmm. Yeah. I guess it, it depends, though. The one thing that I would sort of say to qualify that is like, it depends, again, like whether or not the policy positions matter at all. Or whether or not, like, because, like, there was this conventional understanding with Trump, which was sort of like what you said, which is that, like, uh, Trump has kind of, like, upended the Republican consensus on cer certain issues, and that he's revealed a sort of, like, suppressed desire on the part of Republican voters for, you know, an alternative policy position. And, you know, I think that that was a good theory of the case, but I also, like, just wonder to the degree that it's just Trump. Like, it's just personal loyalty to him. He tells it like it is. Like, there's a deep sort of personal affinity for Trump and a deep trust in Trump, where it's just like what Trump is saying is determined to be the right position. Mm -hmm. Not that Trump is, like, brave and has embraced, like, clever new policy positions that are helping the Republican Party grow. It's just that, like, Trump is Trump, and Trump is helping the Republican Party grow. And that there is no policy position in one direction or another that he could take that would either expand or limit his appeal because it's just a man. It's know? like, does God command things that are good or are they good because God commands yes, them? Does yes, that, precisely. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, there's my, my guess after Trump um, is there's probably a lot of things that just kind of run concurrently with each other. And we assumed the causality on one when in reality it's just correlated with another thing that's highly causal. Yeah. So it might be the case that uh, for a long time people have had these political dispositions and we've thought the policy positions were what mattered. Yes, yes. But in reality, yeah, they're just proxies for some other thing. And if you change the position, as long as that other thing is unchanged, nobody this, actually this, cares. This is exactly something that I feel like I am trying to reckon with a lot as somebody that has traditionally identified as conservative. And I think this is actually the case with like a lot of sort of uh, never Trump uh, conservative types. Do you consume the bulwark at all? I don't. I'm familiar of like, I'm familiar with never Trump Republicans, yeah, but the bulwark is like their main publication. It's really good. Okay. You, should, you might like some of their content. Are they the ones that started the, um, fuck me, was it the Lincoln project? They're like, I think like sort of the... loosely associated with it. They okay. all, the, their big thing was, um, I, th I forget what it's called now. I think it's like called Former Republicans Against Trump. Okay. And they make ads that are quite persuasive, I think, because they interview people that have voted for Trump in the past and talk about why they don't like him or people that were Republicans and don't like him and, and all that. But, uh, but um, one of their big positions that they sort of engage with a lot is the question of whether or not conservatism and like this big robust conservative movement of William F. Buckley and Goldwater and Ronald Reagan and you know this whole sort of canon that appeals to a certain a certain crowd um, a certain crowd of like intellectuals and pundits the National Review types and all that where I used to work 
Um, the question is sort of like whether or not that stuff, these policy and philosophic positions were ever what made conservatism attractive, right? Or whatever made the Republican Party attractive, or whether or not there just is a kind of like somewhat reactionary faction of American politics or American society that just wants to vote for the party that's like the, the party that's against the left broadly understood or the progressive side broadly understood. And they don't really have a clear sense of what they want from Washington or what they want from the Republican Party. They just will kind of like want a strong party that will crush the bad element of American society. And yeah, that, that, and I, how do you even, I feel like measuring that would be so hard because you can't take anybody at their word because people don't genuinely yeah. know, right? But I think, that, I think that in that sense, sort of like, and what the sort of some of these bulwark people would say is that Trump was kind of the, the, the test. Like, if you put somebody who is just like as unappealing and sort of dopey as Trump up on the ballot, but if he, and if his only political skill is like rhetoric against the other side, like, is that enough for the Republican? base is that enough for the republican electorate and it seems like it was which then makes you second guess like well, why did we have all these eggheads and all these people like making their serious like why did we have paul ryan like why did the republican culture produce paul ryan when it could have just produced donald trump and maybe that would have got you know beat obama in mm -hmm. You know, but then it's also hard to tell that like because a thing could have happened for one reason and then as time goes on it morphs into something else but you don't even realize it like maybe at one point in time these values were incredibly important but these values attract a certain type of people but then these type of people don't actually care about the values but they kind of remain just because and then at some point if something changes everybody's like well, hold on have you i don't know if they actually have this experiment but have you heard of the one with like five monkeys in a room and there's like an electric shock if there's a banana at the top of a ladder no the idea is um th there's some similar -ish experiments you can run that seem to work but uh, five monkeys are in a room one of them tries to go for the banana and the floor shocks all the monkeys if you yes. try to grab the banana so they pull them down you swap one monkey out you add another in the new one will run for the banana but as soon as he does everybody pulls him down yeah. before the shock even happens mm. a second monkey is thrown in until eventually you've replaced every monkey you can turn off the electric shocks but the learned behavior is still there mm. such that when a when a new monkey comes out even though there's four in there that have never felt the negative stimulus before as soon as the new monkey goes for the thing they pull him down because that's just what they've learned to do yeah. um i think on youtube i've seen where people will do these experiments where if you go into an office to wait and there's a whole bunch of like plants oh, yes, there yes. the standing up and the sitting yes, down yeah yes, people yes. will do it and they'll teach that behavior even when everyone else has moved out of the room yes. to new people that come in yes. um yeah so then you wonder that like maybe things existed for a reason at one point in time but now they don't but the convention is there and people stuck with it and then people find out well actually this convention doesn't matter anymore yes. um so it was, so then then the question is like well now you're in a totally new battlefield where who knows what's okay or what's not okay and we've been saying this in american politics since trump won the first election what's the field going to look like going forward is has everything changed uh irrecoverably but I mean, it seems like it hasn't because we haven't produced a whole bunch of Trump-like candidates. We got Vivek, who kind no, of, we, sort we, of was. I think, I think we have. I think you that think when so? You, I think that when you look at the sort of people, and again, my buddies at the Bulwark, this is how I, asking for like a good source. I feel like a lot of my political awareness is now coming from this one site, but mm -hmm. they do a really good job of documenting just how many MAGA freaks are getting elected all over the place. Like the sort of people that are running sort of people that are winning nominations uh, to be, you know, senator, governor, state legislator, state senate, you know, county Your Marjorie commissioner. Marjorie Taylor Greens and stuff, yeah. Yeah, it's like, it's not just Marjorie Taylor Green. Like, you can go down the list, and what you will often find is that if, if the choice in a Republican primary at any level is between, like, a complete MAGA space lasers wacko, and then, like, some, you know, guy who's been a loyal servant of the Republican Party and worked his way through the state legislature and then I was state attorney general and da, 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 da. and if they're both like running in a primary for governor like the the Republican base will vote for the crackpot before they'll vote for the sort of the standard Republican I guess the question is is are these like are these like spiritually down ballot votes for Trump like if Trump disappears yeah. is there still going to be the fervor for these types of people I think so because I think that like sort of like Trump has allowed uh, a normalization of a lot of like crankish right-wing views and conspiracy theories and rhetoric and style like that has now been normalized and i think a lot of republicans have realized or a lot of republican voters have realized it's like oh we can have that like that's okay like we can vote for that that's a choice and it seems like a lot of republicans will gladly take that choice if it's offered to them they're mm -hmm. not going for an argument that appeals to anything else. They're not going for arguments that appeal to experience or competence or any sort of policy agenda. They're going for politicians that resemble Trump and make them feel the way that Trump makes them feel. And I think that the idea of like a politician 
making you feel a certain way is a very underrated uh, aspect of, of political appeal in general. I definitely agree with that. That's why people spoke favorably of like Clinton and Biden and very un disfavorably of Mrs. Clinton. Yes, yes. <laughs> um, although I, I am curious, I'm not fully sold on that. I guess we'll see when Trump is gone forever from politics, whether he wins or loses the next election cycle. But like, it, what would the alternative be though? Like what would, like what, who would be elected if not many Trumps? I feel like the I feel like the, the the cycle of populism is somebody promises you the world yes. and they have really enticing rhetoric and actually I am kind of mad right now and this guy channels that anger but then once they get into office they kind of have this um, it's like entering adulthood period that everybody has the crypto guys did it uh, when they discovered well maybe central banking exists for a reason or mm -hmm. uh, you know computer engineers did it when they were like oh maybe all these traditional engineering practices should apply to coding as well everybody has this moment where like okay all of the institutions and all of the things that existed before were here for good reason. Trump came into office and he was still funny. He still had good tweets and he still was like, you know, entertaining to watch on camera. But um, man, he was a horrendously ineffective leader. Yeah. And I feel like populism runs its course when you've had your guy come in and he's like, OK, well, actually, I don't know how anything works. I can't get anything done. And my good words will only carry it so far until people are like, OK, well, we're kind of done with this. And then you move on to the next thing, mm. uh, which is usually back to kind of uh, the status quo. But I could be totally wrong on that. I hope I'm not because holy f the conservative party in the U.S. is insane right now. Well, I mean, I guess, I guess, I mean, like what makes it really nefarious is that they do not have a mindset that can acknowledge the reality of their own defeat, right? Like that was in some ways the most sinister thing that Trump did, yeah. was that in a normal healthy democracy, when you lose, there has to be some degree of reckoning. You know, there was the famous Republican autopsy when Mitt Romney lost, right? But like Trump has created this sort of world in which the Republicans never lose, right? There's only conspiracies that prevent them. And that somehow the true American majority is always craving Republican rule, right? So that's... That mindset, that attitude, you know, Carrie Lake has this attitude in Arizona as well, you know, still refuses to concede that she lost that gubernatorial election, right? Mm -hmm. And when that becomes normalized, then you have like basically uh, prevented, like you've inoculated yourself against the possibility that there can ever be a moment to catch your breath and reckon and reflect on what's gone wrong because they've already talked about how the next election is going to be rigged yes. like this, this conversation they've already prepared that 